and our economy running. Thank you to the over 10 million Ontarians who have already received both doses. Two weeks ago, we announced another measure to increase vaccination rates and protect Ontarians by requiring proof of vaccination to access certain settings beginning September 22nd. Already, we are seeing the impact with over 90,000 first doses administered in the week following our announcement to require proof of vaccination, an increase of 29% from the previous week. To ensure individuals, families and business know what to expect, today we are sharing new materials and guidance to prepare them for these changes and help address any questions. And together with our health system partners, we are continuing our last mile strategy to reach even more Ontarians who have yet to receive their first or second dose. We are using every tool available to make it easier and more convenient to receive the vaccine and help address hesitancy. Physicians are calling their unvaccinated patients to answer their questions. Our GoVax bus continues to visit schools, malls and community and sporting events and over 550 vaccination clinics are underway or planned in or nearby elementary schools, high schools and colleges and universities. We know some people may have questions about whether the vaccine is safe for youth and pregnant individuals and whether one dose is good enough instead of two. I want to be very clear. All Health Canada approved vaccines are safe, effective and significantly reduce your risk of serious illness from COVID-19. If you have questions, please reach out to your health care provider who can walk you through your specific situation and the benefits of getting vaccinated. So please, if you haven't received your first or second dose, sign up today. And in advance of September 22nd, I encourage everyone to print or download your vaccination receipt from the provincial booking portal as soon as possible. Thank you. And I will now hand it over to Minister Rashid. Thank you, Minister Elliott, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm here alongside Minister Elliott and Dr. Moore today to share an update on the technology we are developing to support the Ministry of Health's public health measures. Right now, most people across the province can download and print their vaccine certificates from Ontario.ca. You can choose to save this certificate on your phone or print a copy and carry it with you. Next Wednesday, September 22nd, these vaccine certificates, along with a piece of valid government-issued ID, will be what you show at the door when asked to verify that you have been vaccinated where it is required. For Phase 2, which starts October 22nd, I'm pleased to report that we are on track to release both our enhanced vaccine certificate with a QR code and the QR code verification app for businesses. When released, these work will follow as follows. For people, your vaccine certificate will have a QR code. That is your vaccination credential that you will provide when needed. For businesses, we are releasing a free app that you can download from Apple's App Store or the Google Play App Store onto a smartphone and quickly and easily scan QR codes which will tell you if a person can enter your establishment. We have chosen this approach for two reasons. First, a QR code that is your enhanced vaccine certificate will make it easier, more secure and convenient to show that you have been vaccinated when you need to. And second, our Made in Ontario app will make it quicker and easier for businesses to confirm that a person's vaccine certificate is valid. I want to be very clear. On October 22nd, you will have the choice to download the QR code enhanced vaccine certificate or you can continue to use the print version. And to make it easy for businesses, we will be releasing the free app to quickly scan and verify those QR codes. 
your information will never be stored on our app and the app will only show the minimum amount of information needed to confirm that an individual has been fully vaccinated. Like other leading digital governments, we are also building the app and plan to release the app as open source software. It is transparent tech that can be continuously improved. We have some of the most talented developers and designers in Ontario working on this app. My team at the Ontario Digital Service is building the app in-house, taking advice from the private sector and other jurisdictions to help us get this right to protect your data and privacy from the start. We also know how important it is to support businesses with the tools and information they need to adjust to these new requirements. We will also provide guidance for businesses on the app in advance of its launch. I'm proud of the part that our digital team is playing to help keep people safe and our province open. And I look forward to regularly sharing updates on this important work with you. Thank you, and I will now turn things over to Dr. Moore. Thank you, Minister Elliott and Minister Rashid, and good afternoon. As we continue to learn to live with COVID-19, the data is telling us that the most important step to protect ourselves and each other is to get fully vaccinated. The numbers are telling the story. Those who are unvaccinated are 24 times more likely to be in a hospital than those that are fully vaccinated. They are 43 times more likely to be a patient in intensive care settings compared to those that are fully vaccinated. Vaccines are safe. They are effective. They work to protect Ontarians. Ontario is following the evidence when it comes to third doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as following the recommendations from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. A complete two-dose COVID-19 vaccine series provides strong protection against COVID-19 infection and severe outcomes, including against the Delta variant in the general population. However, for some populations, a third dose may be required to provide sufficient protection because of a waning immune response to vaccines and increased risk of COVID-19 infection. So today we are expanding the eligibility for additional vulnerable populations, including those undergoing active treatment for solid tumors, those who are in receipt of chimeric antigen receptor, so CAR T cells, individuals with severe or moderate primary immunodeficiencies, individuals receiving active treatment for significantly immunosuppressive conditions, and individuals with stage three or advanced untreated HIV infection and those with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. The locations and timing for third doses will vary by public health unit and high risk population based on local planning and considerations. Immunocompromised individuals with one of the eligible conditions will be contacted by their health care provider to confirm their eligibility and provide them with a referral to a vaccine delivery channel, such as a hospital, a specialized clinic, pharmacy, or primary care provider. Please be patient as it may take time for health care providers to reach out to all the eligible individuals. The months ahead will be challenging. COVID-19 is not going away and the risk poses will continue throughout the fall and winter. We've seen how the virus can change and it can spread and we need to be humble, resilient and adaptable. We will continue to take cautious and reasonable actions based on the data and evidence to ensure there is a strong chain of protection for all Ontarians but we know that vaccination is the key to protecting ourselves and especially our most vulnerable. Again, please roll up your sleeve and get the shot. Please get vaccinated. Thank you. We're gonna go to the 
floor first for questions. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. Um, question for you, Minister. Um, a, a lot of people are kind of looking at this and wondering how some of this makes sense. So if I'm an unvaccinated individual, I can't go into a restaurant, I can go to the patio. But if I need to use the washroom or pay, I can go into the restaurant. Is there going to be somebody in that restaurant minding where I go after I go into the washroom? Well, I think to explain the consistency for this, I would refer this to Dr. Moore. Uh, thanks very much for the question. It really depends upon the risk associated with an individual. So we uh, have always assumed outdoors is safer than indoors. If you go indoors and it's less than 15 minutes, the risk of exposures to others is much less. You also, as you go indoors, will be wearing a mask. So our typical contact tracing is 15 minutes or less uh, would, uh, would not be a high-risk contact, even if you had COVID. Uh, and, and so hence the reason uh, short visits indoors uh, to a washer to pay a bill uh, are allowed uh, and, and no one's going to be monitoring that exact amount of time. Uh, it, it, it's based on best evidence. It's also based on some assumptions that it will be 15 minutes or less uh, and that you'll be masked in that environment. And I, I just wanted to ask a question about enforcement of all of this. I know the Solicitor General is obviously not here. Um, there are a lot of businesses who are already saying we're not going to partake in this, uh, particularly gyms who are saying already we are not going to ask people for their vaccine status. Uh, what level of, of monitoring is the province doing about these businesses and uh, how will it be enforced? Because it seems like the enforcement right now is at, at the point of a disagreement not necessarily proactively seeking out businesses that are saying we're not going to participate in this. This is for the, for the Deputy Premier, if you don't mind. Sorry. Thank you. Well, this is required and there will be bylaw enforcement officers that will be available, that will be doing a lot of the monitoring there and making sure that businesses conform as we're expecting individuals to conform to the requirements. And uh, on the other side of it, if there are any businesses that are concerned that uh, when they refuse entry, to a restaurant, a gym, or whatever it happens to be, that if any point they feel uh, threatened, we want them to call uh, 911 as soon as possible to make sure that our uh, uh, police officers can be there to assist. We want to make sure that everyone conforms to these rules. Uh, but if anyone feels threatened, we do have the facilities available for people to seek help. Sorry, Minister, just to follow up on that. That's going to be a, a lot of 911 calls. How do, you, how do you balance all these people calling or businesses calling 911 over um, an unvaccinated individual versus somebody who legitimately needs uh, ambulatory services? Are, are you, is there more money going to uh, these, these services to ensure that they can keep up with the increased demand? I don't anticipate the demand is going to be huge because we're asking people to be reasonable. Uh, we have let people know what the requirements are well in advance of the changes being made. People do have until September 22nd to uh, to be vaccinated. We are encouraging everyone who is able to be vaccinated to please go out and do so. If you have concerns, please reach out to your primary care provider to discuss that with them to determine if there is a reason why you should not be vaccinated. But most people, most can be vaccinated. And we're asking them to do that. And again, asking people to be reasonable. Please follow the rules. Again, I don't anticipate there will be huge calls, 911 calls, uh, for that reason, that people understand what the rules are. And we're simply expecting people will follow them. Hi, Minister. Uh, this morning during the technical briefing, a lot of journalists pointed out that it wouldn't be too hard to get a fake doctor's note for a, you know, claiming medical ex exemption. Um, and the response from the ministry was, well, fraud is, is definitely a possibility. Is this something that is of concern to you? And are you going to do anything to address that? Well, we certainly um, anticipate that that won't happen. There may be some situations where it does, but that's only going to be for the period from September 22nd to October 22nd when the medical exemption will be imprinted into the QR code. But I would ask perhaps Minister Rashid to speak to the more specific issues around that.
Thank you very much, and thank you for the question. Yes, so we are actually working on the QR code, as uh, mentioned earlier, that these are some of the guidelines in terms of medical uh, exemptions that eventually will be uh, input into the QR system, and uh, this way the businesses, when they are scanning uh, the QR code, will be able to receive the message in terms of whether the individual is uh, eligible to enter the establishment or not. Thank you. My follow-up is for the Deputy Premier. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the creation of safe zones around hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yesterday I was at the, uh, covering the protest at Toronto General. I saw several patients having to be escorted by police officers through the crowd. So I is this something that uh, your government is ready to legislate on or, or get tougher on to protect healthcare workers and patients who are coming in and out of the hospital? Well, I know there has been some discussion about safe zones. We would have to uh, uh, see what the uh, people who have raised it uh, would actually have in mind before we could say yes to any of that. But right now, what we are looking at is to um, ask people to make sure that if they are protesting, if it's a peaceful protest and they're not interfering with the uh, hospital's operations or people's ability, staff or patients, to come and go inside or outside the hospital, then uh, we are going to um, we're going to work with our police uh, officers as well. They're monitoring the situation as well. If there's some indication that there is any uh, problem with people having that access, then um, the uh, police officers will take the appropriate action. But we are asking people that if you wish to protest. Certainly you may do so, but do not interfere with the hospital's operations. And I would also say that this is very, very demoralizing to our frontline health care workers who have been working flat out to save people's lives for the last 18 months. And so I think it, it's just very unfortunate that uh, this is happening with the protesters and uh, we would please ask them to to think about the great work that our frontline health care workers are doing and and uh, and please um, stop these protests because they're uh, really um, very discouraging to our frontline health care workers we'll go to the phone lines just a reminder one question one follow-up your first question comes from Matthew Bingley with Global News please go ahead Hi, Matthew. Hi, Minister. I, I'm just wondering, when it comes to the medical exemption notice, uh, on the technical briefing we heard that there was a sample that was going to be sent out to uh, doctors if they choose to use it, but it's not being required. I'm just wondering why that decision was made to not have a simple form to actually make sure that there is no fraud when it comes to these uh, notes being written. Um, I'm going to refer that to Dr. Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. So, um, very pleased that the Registrar for the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario has come out with guidance uh, on medical exemptions uh, for COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, the Registrar has identified two and has communicated that to all physicians in Ontario. Uh, the first being a severe uh, allergic reaction to any of the components confirmed by an allergist. Uh, the second being uh, inflammation to the heart, the heart, um, the, the sac around the heart called myocarditis or pericarditis. Uh, those are the two major medical exemptions that have been identified to date. Uh, there may be a third category associated with a adverse event following immunization um, for specific neurologic uh, or other ongoing symptoms, but those would be investigated by specialists. So very, very few exemptions uh, that are listed and the, and the registrar has defined that you must put um, the exact uh, reason for medical exemption as well as the duration that that medical exemption uh, should be in place, uh, as well as identify yourself and your college uh, uh, identification. So there are forms that will standardize this for nurse practitioners as well as physicians and a standardized exemption format. Um, if there is abuse of this uh, by physicians or uh, nurses of the extended class, uh, there may be professional um, um, discipline for them. Uh, and if there's fraud, there is a process through uh, the reopening of Ontario Act enforcement uh, that can deal with the fraud aspect. Follow up. Yeah, and, and perhaps this is for uh, Minister Rashid. I'm just wondering, uh, earlier he said that come October 22nd, there's the possibility of using either the digital side 
or the paper uh, option that will be on uh, beginning next week, but when you were specifically talking about the QR code that will be given for those medical exemptions, will people with those be required to use the digital system or is there still an option to go back and forth? I believe uh, when we look into the uh, QR code, uh, the medical exemption is going to be embedded. It's the data that we are taking from the Ministry of Health and putting into the QR code system. And eventually, yes, I mean, if uh, somebody doesn't want to use the QR code because uh, people have the choice, then I'm sure uh, at some point Ministry of Health will be looking into uh, issuing a, an exemption a certificate. But from a technological side, the QR code eventually will have uh, a system in place uh, that will allow uh, for medical exemptions uh, to be embedded into the QR code system. Next question. Okay, next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just a little, um, uh, could use a little bit of clarification on the medical exemption forms. Uh, Dr. Moore was just saying that if anyone is is abusing these on the, on the medical side, like giving an exemption where it's not warranted, um, there, there could be professional uh, 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 discipline. How will that, that get discovered? Would that get discovered if a doctor's or a nurse practitioner's practice is being audited? Uh, because otherwise, I think these letters uh, would be, uh, or the details would just be between the doctor and the patient. Uh, well, they will uh, be uh, reviewed. There will be, uh, as the um, things are uploaded to the uh, the code, the QR code, that there will be um, some uh, review of what's going on. I think I would refer that to Minister Rashid to answer specifically how that would be dealt with. Thank you for the question. So the, uh, from a technology side, uh, once uh, the information is in the system, in our health uh, system, uh, COVAX, that COVAX system will be connected to our uh, QR code system, which will then look at all the data available in that system. And then that system, the QR code, will be uh, spilling out the information when the individuals uh, will be using the verifier app uh, at, at businesses. So all information in the QR code will be connected to the Ministry of Health uh, system in order to get that information. Follow-up? All right, thank you. And I, I know it will be in a small number of people who have had vaccinations such as Sinopharm or uh, Sputnik or whatever. How is someone working the front of a restaurant or manning the gate at, a, at an Argos game supposed to be able to verify what's a real uh, certificate for for Sputnik or Sinopharm, it might be in another language, it might be unfamiliar. What kind of guidance are you giving on that, and, and how is that going to be handled? Again, I'll ask Minister Rashid to, uh, to deal with that question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So the QR code, uh, as mentioned earlier, will be connected to the Ministry of Health uh, COVAX system that's going to allow the data to be embedded into the, the QR code system. So when individuals go to a, a restaurant or at a gym or any establishment where they need to show the proof of vaccination, the app, the verifier app, will then display the information based on whether the individual is uh, able to enter the establishment or not. Uh, the vaccination uh, proof will be uh, in the QR code system, and that system will then, uh, the verifier app will then provide all the details, uh, and it's very minimum details whether the individual can enter the establishment or not with a check mark or an X. Next question. Holly mckenzie Suter with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, following up again about the uh, medical exemptions to the policy. Um, we just know that, you know, businesses aren't being asked to validate the medical exemptions. It's already raising a lot of questions here today about the loopholes this creates and fraud possibilities. Um, and I know that BC isn't allowing medical exemptions at all in its proof of vaccination policy. So, Mr. Elliott, could you explain why Ontario is allowing for medical exemptions to the policy when these services aren't essential? 
Well, we know that there are some people that aren't able to receive the vaccine. We don't want them to be turned away from establishments if they haven't been vaccinated. So this gives them the opportunity to uh, be, to be able to enter. There will be that short interim period from September 22nd when the policy comes into place until October 22nd when the QR codes become available, where there may be some situations where people don't have valid uh, uh, medical exemptions. However, we expect that they will be few and far between. But once the QR code comes into place as of October 22nd, as Minister Rashid has said, that they will be um, updated using the COVAX system. And then we will know uh, whether it's a medical exemption uh, that qualifies or not. Follow up. Ollie, do you have a follow up? Oh, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, apologies for that. No, I, just, um, I don't think that totally addresses the loophole question because we know that um, people don't have to download the QR code. But I have another question about enforcement. I'm just wondering what's being planned for the first days of this policy in terms of um, law enforcement, bylaw, police, like our... Um, are police forces assigning people specifically to deal with enforcement issues as they come up? Will there be more officers on the streets or, or near these businesses or even in the businesses when this happens? I'm just wondering about the enforcement planning that's going on right now and what guidance is being given to those. Um, law enforcement bodies. Well, we are working very closely with the uh, Solicitor General, and the Solicitor General has uh, been in contact with uh, uh, police forces across the province just to advise that there may be situations that will arise that may require their assistance. But as for how those police forces will be dealing with it, that will be up to each individual police force to make that determination themselves and to ready themselves accordingly. Last question. Your final question comes from Jeff Gray with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Jeff. Oh, hi, thanks. It's a question uh, for uh, Minister uh, Rashid, just about the, uh, the development of the app. Um, can you tell us uh, who in the private sector uh, the ODS is, is talking to? Are these companies that have produced similar apps in other jurisdictions, or who is advising uh, so the government? Thank you for the question. Uh, my team and I have been working very closely with uh, private sectors. These are the businesses that will be using the app uh, once it's uh, ready, so the Verifier app. And we have been reaching out to uh, organizations, small, medium, large businesses, uh, restaurant industry, uh, tourism, because we want to make sure that we are taking their advice. Uh, we are consulting with them. We want their input as to how what features they would like to see uh, on the app uh, user interface because uh, at the end of the day these businesses are the one who will be using the app so we continue to take their advice and input on the development of the app follow up and this is the last question so thanks yeah just to clarify then there's no there's no plan or there's no uh, consultations underway with uh, you know companies that we've we've heard of before, IBM or any of these types of of companies uh, that are assisting the government in any way on this app. So my team and I uh, are developing this app in house, uh, and we will continue to take advice from uh, businesses because at the end of the day, we w these businesses are the ones who will be using this app to verify uh, the QR codes. So we continue to take their advice, their input, and we continue to consult with them because we want to release a product at the end of the day that's going to help these businesses uh, continue to operate. Sort of Thanks, people, everyone. I just have a question for Dr. Moore. Just, it, it is a very important question. Last question, Colin. Um, Dr. Thank you very much. Sorry, Dr. Moore, this is our only opportunity with you, and it's once a week. So, um, Haldeman Norfolk has confirmed that uh, Dr. Matt Strauss will be the medical officer of health. Last week, you had said he was unqualified because he didn't have the, the credentials uh, needed specifically to be a, a local medical officer of health. So. What is the next step here from your perspective? Uh, well, I don't know if I said he's unqualified. He the exact qualification. So he, he can be appointed as an interim um, medical officer of health as he is a physician licensed in Ontario. So that uh, is meeting the basic requirements uh, to be a medical officer of health interim. Um, uh, and we are, uh, uh, and the chief medical officer of health 
office here to support him and we'll be staying in regular contact with Haldeman Norfolk as well as all Western Medical Officers of Health um, uh, and be able to consult with him as needed given that he's new. So we'll be supportive of him uh, and try to um, uh, provide guidance um, uh, to him in this new position uh, and keep um, a close partnership with uh, all of our uh, health units but in particular whenever there's a new interim. But he's no longer an interim. They confirmed him last night as the medical officer of health for the region, which I assume now comes before you and the government for some kind of a confirmation. No, he, he is only an interim and staying as an interim. Uh, he cannot be a permanent. A permanent would need the approval of the um, minister, uh, as well as often a review by the chief medical officer of health, and he does not have the qualifications to be a permanent. So Thanks, you, everyone. That's it. In order to step in. Last week you had indicated that you were willing to step in. What would you need to see being done or not being done in order to step well, in and hold well, them in normal? We will first provide guidance and support. Uh, uh, he may be new uh, to outbreak management and or to the immunization strategy, and we'll be monitoring um, uh, adherence to best practices uh, in that region. Uh, and if I have any concerns, uh, regarding the safety and health of that community, I can step in as the Chief Medical Officer of Health and will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.